no, I have a sneak peek. That's okay. There I didn't see anything important yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oops. Welcome to Farmcraft Food for Thought. This is an exciting stream because today we get to peek behind the curtain and see how exactly does Clever Like <laughs> make all these things happen. Maybe not how exactly, but how at least partially does Clever Like make these things happen. Um, so welcome today to the NASAP Farmcraft live stream. I am Claire LeBeau, your host. I am the Director of Communications at NASAP, the North America Scholastic Esports Federation. We combine play and learning pretty well, if I may say so myself. I certainly have a lot of fun playing, and also I have had a lot of fun learning. I've learned a ton through these live streams. So um, diving into another one, let's do a quick round robin. Um, Dr. Adam Ant, take it away. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Cornish. I work as an agricultural policy advisor at the U.S. Department of State. Um, and you know, you've probably seen me on here, and if you haven't, watch all our old videos. They're a lot of fun. Um, really, I'm just excited to continue to promote Farmcraft and really today dive further into um, Brian Cleverleg's brain about how he put all of these interesting challenges together and maybe see if he gives you guys a little a couple tips to figure out how to uh, maximize your scores. So I'll pass it. I'll continue the trend and bring it on over to Eric right here, that guy. Right. Oh my God. You, you, I, I never get to go early on and I'm like, oh, you always save me for the end. This is great. Uh, so hello everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Leitner, uh, River on the streams. Uh, so I guess both. Um, I'm not going to go into all the names. Uh, I'm a STEM and computer science instructional facilitator. I'm a global Minecraft mentor and I am a lover of lifelong learners, which is why this team is amazing. Uh, Claire had just mentioned she learned so much on these streams. So do I. And, um, and that's, that's why I love being a part of this. So I'm excited to be a part of that. And you know what, since we're kind of going in a circle, I'm just gonna go straight down to Lynn. Uh, Lynn, say hi. <laughs> hello, thank you, Eric. Um, hello, everyone. And a special shout out to American spaces that are participating in Farmcraft 2022, because I am Lynn Scheib, the partnerships coordinator from the Office of, the Amer of American Spaces in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State. And so Adam's colleague, and I am a, definitely a lifelong learner and I'm so delighted to be a part of Farmcraft 2022. And so I will pass the baton on to my very good friend with the wonderful headphones, Kathy Chow Isaacs. Hello, everybody. Um, Lynn, your title is officially longer than Eric's. Eric's is always the longest. Wait, that, that's yeah. only because I didn't spell it all out because it's STEM plus CS instructional facilitator. But if I say science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and computer science instructional uh, facilitator. I don't know. <laughs> then I, I think I win again, but you know. <laughs> we love to speak in acronyms, but then no one understands us. Accurate. And it's not a competition, yep. Eric, unless Kathy makes it one. No, it's, no, no. It's not a It's a competition. <laughs> We're true. all about that competition. It, yes. It, yes, yes, yes. So, G -L -H -F. aloha, everyone. GL what? Oh, okay. GLHF. You know. I'm usually the one looking up what the acronyms mean and then showing them on screen afterwards. So uh, I'm Kathy Chow Isaacs. I'm part of this really awesome Minecraft team with NASA. Uh, we come up with all the challenges and we get to play. Oh, I do know that one. I know that one. Um, and uh, I am aware of all crowns, many crowns. And what else? Oh, and I'm a global Minecraft mentor. And if I told you all the things I do, you'd be like, oh my gosh, the stream is over. So with that. <laughs> Wait, let me go this way, Brian. Hey, everybody. Hi, I'm Clever Like. I get to make video games for a living and uh, kind of sneak in the vegetables for kids without them knowing by making it educational and entertaining. So, um, so yeah, that's what we do. And I'm glad to be part of the stream today and uh, look forward to giving away some secrets. Just a few, not all of them. Itty bitty bitty little ones. Itty bitty bitty yeah, for the record, if they've been paying attention to the comments he made last time, and I guess we'll mention it again. There's that that whole Twitter thing you got going when it comes to secrets. Yeah, I won't say anymore. I'm sorry. Beefy. 
<laughs> we were so excited to dance to our music for our video that I got ahead of myself. Yeah, forget about it. Are we going to play that music or what? Or is it too late? Okay. Dang, and then I was muted, so I was saying something and you couldn't even hear me. Uh, it wouldn't be a call. It wouldn't be a live right stream uh, if yeah. somebody wasn't muted. So you're just making it work. All right, thank you. I was going to play the video but after we did our introductions, but first, because you mentioned the tips, let's talk about the tips because those have been awesome. And if somebody is not getting the tips, I would say you definitely have a disadvantage at this point. So big clever one, like, where do, we, where do we find those? Yeah, so there's a hashtag on Twitter called Farmcraft Tips. So hashtag Farmcraft Tips, one word. And we put together like several weeks of tips that kind of reveal some details about the game. Some of them are hints that you don't necessarily know in the game. Some are things that are like maybe a little dip more difficult to figure out. Uh, so if you missed it in the game, you could find it in, in uh, those tweets, but they also kind of give you some tips on, on how to play. So I think it definitely give you an advantage to read through those and see uh, if they, if they spark any ideas that you didn't have before. Right, exactly. So I'm just looking at a couple of the tips, for example, are what to do when the harvester appears. Um, and let's see, we've got a whole bunch here. Um, like one of the important ones that's a good highlight is to not forget to choose um, no-till after a season of hardy grass. The purpose of hardy grass is to replenish the soil. And the idea of, of that is that, that the nutrients from, those, from, from that crop being integrated back into the soil brings your soil quality up. So it actually in the game will bring your soil quality up to 1,000 if you choose no-till after hardy grass. So the strat there is like in the, in your previous season, let your soil get down as low as possible. Don't, don't necessarily invest over, over invest in fertilizing when you know that the crops are going to give that back, uh, into the soil. Uh, and it's, it's just a little strategy, save you some money, get you some more, more output. Mm, well, and it also sounds like that might mirror the reality of agriculture, right? When you till in different ways and the different order that you plant your crops really matters a lot. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You can have entire conversations with farmers about their like three year plan, you know, like how they're going to do the crop rotation uh, throughout all that time to make sure that they're maximizing their, the soil health while also getting the maximum profits out of it. Yeah, right. for sure. Well, I started us off and we did our introductions and probably everybody watching knows all about Farmcraft, but we love this video so much. So I'm going to go ahead and play it anyway. You can watch us dance along as it goes <laughs> and hopefully you will be too. And then we're going to come back and take a look at some of the submissions we've seen so far. That's so awesome. good. That is so good. <laughs> I was at a um, collegiate esports event over the weekend and met a teacher and her some of her students that are doing farm craft. And they were so excited because they made a natural disaster happen. And I said, <laughs> do you know, actually, that's not the goal. But I understand your excitement because we did the same thing. When we were testing the world, we said, how do we, how do we get that tornado? We want to get that tornado. So, <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah, you I test the it. limits in a safe and place. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, there's there's a bit of a uh, Easter egg in the tornado. That you could lose hours <laughs> of time in that. 
Ah. That's right. Ah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, Eric, um, we wanted to take a look at some of the Challenge 2 videos that we have. Yes. So. Yeah. So, so Challenge 2, uh, we gave the students a very specific focus. And mind you, Challenge 2 is still open. Uh, all you know, we want you to submit all three. Remember that all three submissions for all three challenges, and we're going to announce the third challenge uh, by the end of this stream. <laughs> I can't avoid the chat. You know what? Here, you guys want to get a look, good look real quick. Okay, we're going to get that out of the way. Um, if you are not on YouTube, there are comments about how fabulous Eric's beard is in the YouTube chat. <laughs> That's right. It's not easy. Well it's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, <laughs> At some point, we got to add the handlebar mustache and things like that. We'll get there. <laughs> but um, challenge two, or I'm sorry, I was saying all three challenges are required for pri prize eligibility. So when you're submitting your scores uh, from in your game world, you want to make sure that those three uh, regular season challenges, which are essentially video diary submissions, are completed. So for the first one, we just wanted you to get into a biome and make some connections to some of the content that we've been talking about, some of the information we talked about with farmers, what's based on reality and what isn't. Uh, and then challenge two, which is going on right now still, we wanted you to focus all of your efforts, every last bit of effort you had on profit. We wanted you to turn a profit by any means necessary. Just, just that's right. Just all about the Make dollars. It rain. Or, or yeah, no, the cash. That's all dinero. <laughs> Whatever it is, that's all Make we wanted. Rain. That's right. So that's all we wanted you to do. And of course, we wanted you to reflect on that process. How did that affect? How did that kind of decision making affect everything else that was happening in the world? Uh, so we wanted to share two of the entries we've gotten so far. I know entries are still coming in. That number has gone up from yesterday to today. And we know that they're not due uh, just yet. So keep those entries coming. We want to see them from everybody. But let's take a look at two. So the first one we're going to look at is from Team TLCS Gold from Botswana. So let's take a look Hello at one of our from Botswana. My team completed tropical, desert, tundra, island, and temperate. My team and I made decisions about the seed to buy and the modification type. We also decided who was going to add water and fertilizers to our crops, get the butterflies and earn more money, and kill the, bad, the caterpillars. When we placed our focus on money, this affected our climate because we spent a lot of money on water and fertilizers in all the seasons. Focusing only on our profit made us get tempted not to buy a lot, which sometimes led to low climate scores. Yes, our team did experience limitations along the way, such as natural disaster and also dealing with the caterpillars to prevent them from eating the crops. As a huge challenge, we stopped using the modern, the modern farming technologies provided such as drones, tractors, pesticides, and a lot more because they cost a lot of money and impact our climate negatively. If, no managed, if not managed well, this always led to natural disaster. Thank you for this opportunity, Nesef. Okay, so. Nice. All right, so yeah, awesome. lots of connections being made there, right? Between, uh, you know, obviously being able to, or what decisions have to be made just to make a profit, but also what kind of impact it had when that was our sole focus. Right. So they, they mentioned some of the strategies they used it, like sort of like both on both ends, right? Like what crops can we grow? in order to turn a profit and where can we sort of cut corners in order to turn mm -hmm. a profit as well, right? Avoiding certain technology because it's just too costly. Yep. And that catches up to you, you know, you start cutting corners and then eventually you gotta, you gotta invest in all of it at once. So yeah, I, I, that's an interesting point, especially where, you know, they, they're not seeing much cost in the pre harvest, uh, like pre planting and everything, but during the planting season, they're probably having to increase the amount that they, they spend potentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To make up for it. Exactly. All right. And then Eric, what is this other, this next video that we're going to see? I wanted to share this one as well because they had some slightly different perspectives on it and uh, you know, their, their reflection on it was a little bit different. Uh, but this is Team Tech from Cape May Courthouse. I love the name of the city, uh, New Jersey. So 
uh, way across from Botswana, not even close to Botswana. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why our perspective is a little bit different. So let's take a look at the entry from Team Tech. The biomes we completed for this challenge were the temperate and island biomes. This time around, we practiced crop rotation and tried more of the high-risk crops to increase profit. Love that music. If it's, you know, real time, I'm jealous. <laughs> Especially after our last year. Focus only on profit gave us a good amount of money and our climate didn't really suffer. Our soil, however, did. In the island biome, at some point, our soil was at zero and nothing could help. We even tried planting the hardy grass to try to recover the soil. Planters. One interesting thing when you're a guest on somebody else's computer, if there's a little too much latency. The only challenge or limitation was our soil slower. suffering. It was more difficult on the island biome because you couldn't buy the fertilizer that brings your soil up to a thousand. That was because of the small space of the island. Mm. Butterfly! Yeah, multitasking, nice. You say it excitingly, but I see butterflies That's now. Right. I'm <laughs> So uh, yeah, they had a very different experience. And actually one of the outcomes that they mentioned twice that I really thought it was important to kind of uh, talk about was they weren't seeing a massive climate impact, but they were seeing an incredible soil impact. Uh, partially, and they mentioned because they were using the island biome and fertilization, or at least the methods they were using for fertilization were significantly more difficult than what they were used to do. So it, it um, speaks to the importance of selecting the right biome as well. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, the, the previous submission that we saw where they're focusing on tundra, they're going to have to spend a lot of money on improving the soil quality, whereas other biomes, are, that's not nearly as much of an issue. Instead, you're more uh, facing weeds and uh, insects. And perhaps you can do that with uh, less money, maybe if you're you're willing to go out there and do everything by hand. Which yeah, that recording showed that person was pretty good at multitasking, taking care of weeds and butterflies at the same that time. That was pretty impressive. That's, I yeah, mean, yeah. the that was one of the farm craft tips as well. Was that hey, by the way, um, butterflies show up at the same time weeds do. So you know, it's a little bit of a trick to get you distracted and risk losing your uh, your crops while you're hunting down those butterflies. So you've uh, teamwork helps, but also paying attention and multitasking effectively also helps. Uh, so that's a, that's an interesting trick. And there is like, you know, with the, with the, with the uh, biomes, it's cool because some of them are really good with soil, but they're, uh, you know, not so good with some of uh, the other things, other attributes, whereas, you know, the other biomes are, sw are switched, you know, so the good one, ones with good soil have more pests. The one with less pests have harder times with soil. So you're always having to kind of like, put extra effort into one of the areas that makes it challenging. Well, if you have good soil, then your plants are hearty and delicious mm -hmm. for us as the consumers, but also for the pests as consumers, yeah. right? So yeah, and if it's easy to grow area. plants, I mean, that's, right. what, that's what weeds They're are. They're trade-offs, you know? definitely. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So those were um, challenge two videos that we showed, and we just want to remind you that there are three challenges. And so you wanna make sure that you submit all three challenges to participate. One, two, three. Yes, exactly. Very important, very there important. There are three. Very Please important. make sure you submit all win. three challenges in order you to win. All three. And again, it's not too late. So again, yeah. if this is something you're focused on, if right now you're so dedicated to be like, no, we're focused on score. We are single-minded. We're trying to get that score up. Go back in there, get those challenges entered, make sure they're entered. 
because uh, that's going to keep you eligible. Exactly. Perfect. I just have to share this because this is Kathy Chow Isaacs to a T. She is always curious and always trying to find out the details about everything. And so she looked up for us and the two videos we just played, one is from Botswana and one is from Cape May Courthouse in New Jersey. Those places are 12,333 kilometers or 7,663 miles apart. So just think about that for a second. We have students who live literally 7,600 miles apart, participating in the same program and doing the same challenges. Personally, so I cool. love that. I think that's so cool. That is so cool. I tell you, that gave me a really lot nice. of anxiety going into this. <laughs> mm, why is that? <laughs> hey, guys, listen, no pressure, but like the entire world is going to be playing this. The world is watching. <laughs> yes. You know what? Yes. I think... I think that's a good entry point for this, right? Because the whole point of today's live stream is to talk about what you've done uh, as a game developer, right? You're our guest today. You know, even though you're always here with us and asking questions of our, our farming guests and our mm -hmm. scientists guests, uh, but you are our guest. And, and I think a really good place to start is with just that. How do you kind of plan ahead when you've got a, a global audience, an audience that big and say, how do I ensure that all of my audience uh, is going to find what I'm doing understandable, for, you know, uh, attainable, reachable. It's going to make sense to everyone as much as possible. I mean, that seems like a big hurdle. Yeah, for sure. Well, and there's lots of biomes and lots of areas that, like, you know, so I'm familiar with what I see around me and what I've seen around me in my country. And, you know, realizing that there are other countries that have other other challenges, trying to be aware of that and present those challenges in a way that makes it a little more diverse. Uh, again, not being the expert on all of the possibilities, but knowing like, how can I balance this out so that it may, it may work compatible with this area and then find another area that works completely different. So we have to change our perspectives. So I think for all of us playing this game, we're all in our own world. And, and a lot of the younger kids that are playing this haven't really had much of a chance to travel and see what's out there in the rest of the world. So it's a nice, a nice opportunity to see that there is a different style, a different type of challenge to other people around the world. So you just can't assume that your solution is the solution for everybody. Um, you know, and that's a good learning opportunity for me and our team. But, uh, you know, I think it's a great way, like great that we could present that to you where you can be like, oh, okay, I see. Like, you know, if it's colder than where I am, then things would have to be different. Yeah, that's for right. sure. So, exactly. so yeah. Um, so that's cool. You know, so the, the, the different biomes have allowed us to do that. And like you said, you know, I'm always asking questions that this has been an incredible learning opportunity for me, which I just absolutely loved. Uh, so many cool new, new uh, concepts that I learned from this activity. You so want me so to say Brian, that? I'm curious, have you started a garden of your own now? Are you growing things? Yeah, like so. Uh, we're going to be moving soon, so we we don't quite have a uh, a garden this year in our rental house, but we definitely have that on the plan for our new place. And when I created the first farm craft, we did. This is why the caterpillars were such a thing for us because we were growing kale in in our garden, and it was like, yeah, it was like getting real big, and then it was just like disappearing. And my wife would be like. I, I, there's nothing, there's nothing on the plants. I can't see anything. And so I would go out there. I'm like, yeah, it looks like there's nothing, you know? And then I would be like, I don't know what it is. And it'd be eaten more. I'd go out there and then I would look closer and I would, I found 20, 30 caterpillars hiding in the kale, just eating it to smithereens and moving on to the next one. And they were so camouflaged and hidden that the first glance, there was nothing obvious. Uh, and so for me, that's where the caterpillars became such a big motivation because I'm like, wow, just in my backyard with me actually looking at them from two feet away and not being able to spot them. I'm like, what if you multiply that by, you know, thousands or millions for, for commercial agriculture? Like how, if, if I can't manage it on my, in my back porch, basically, how is somebody going to manage it across hundreds of acres? And to me, that really resonated like, wow, like what a challenge and what happens what do you do and these things don't care they just want that food um so that's where for me the butterflies and the caterpillars became such a big part of farm craft was my personal experience yeah wow. they're, they're absolutely pictures. devastating but it, all right sorry, kathy but one question i have is the next game you develop is it going to involve packing boxes <laughs> maybe 
Maybe interior decorating, interior design, uh, building a garden. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> you have to see what's next. All, All right. right. So the caterpillars. Here we clever. are. Yeah, we're I live know. on screen here. Um, here we go. Let's get into the world. Take us on a tour. Uh, you know, if there's anywhere you want to take us, show us. Uh, even starting here in the lobby. Uh, yeah. Kind of well, give us a little behind the scenes of the design process and everything else. Then yeah, yeah all you. <laughs> so um, okay, so a couple things. If you look at these uh, these signs on the wall, these are basically called image maps. So you can kind of right click and spin them around because those are uh, images that we convert using an image map tool that was developed by uh, third you know other people. Put these images in. They show up in our inventory. We stick them onto item frames, and um, you could see how they're all kind of uh, laid out there. And that's how you get some nice graphics inside of, of, of a video game. Uh, Eric, do you want to do you want to do your little trick and go? Should, should we go straight to the hot tub now or should we? Uh, all right. Uh, so, it's, it's, I mean, it's been decommissioned. Uh, and can we at least agree, you know, they're not going to they're not going to be able to do said trick. But, you know. Yeah. Yeah. They well, they. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see what happens. So, so um, education edition has a way of kind of limiting the commands you can type, and so go do slash wb. Yeah, well, first time I'm throwing us into here, right. and now we should be able to. Okay. Okay. Oh, there it is. Adam's the first one in. Get yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, no. Oh, Brian, your mic is uh, oh. <laughs> a little quiet. We turned the bubbles off to uh, to uh, quiet. When you go to, over to the seed person, you could hear the bubbles down there, and I oh, didn't no. want it to be too distracting yeah. to people. So we turned off the bubbles for, for this season. And these chests here, you can see this is where we stored all of the... Uh, the maps that were used for the signs and stuff like that. So this chest is kind of like our storage. If we're building and we need to break something, we always keep a backup of, of the maps handy. So it's nice and easy to access. Uh -huh. So you could see um, they're all stored here. And ahead. This area was, you know, reserved for like, if we needed to build some sort of dance hall to celebrate our harvest or something like that. I like it. <laughs> Love it. I like this. I can walk around with a picture of a cow now, which is all I want to do for the rest of the time. And is the other one just the reverse of that? They're just all the different, different uh, parts. Oh, all the different parts. Each, oh, each, kind of like... each square. Okay. So all of these signs up here for the different biomes yeah. and the other signs on the wall all have maps in the chest that you put all the pieces together to make that image. Uh, so you might think like use like paintings in Minecraft, but this, the sad thing about paintings in Minecraft is that the um, the texture can only be customized so much. This allows you to import basically any image and use them, uh, you know, in item frames. Then another cool way of doing things nowadays is like a particle effect. You can you can put an image in as a particle effect and have that and have that show up. Um, which the particle effect is like the little talking bubble over the uh, the NPCs. That's a that's a particle effect that's attached to the NPC. Wait, so if we gets, wanted to place one of those, we could? Um, you're, you can turn it on and off by tagging the NPC with a certain attribute. And if they have that attribute, the bubble is on. And if they you know, will turn that off after you talk to them to make the uh, particle go away to show that you've accomplished talking to them. So yeah, that's how that's how that goes, and and you want to you'll want to turn on uh, command blocks before we go into into a biome, and maybe we could choose maybe we could choose the. Okay. I don't know. If, yeah, how ma how many secrets we want to reveal here, but the um, uh, what biome would we want to choose? <laughs> the cold that's one has. Um, has a, a little bit of an interesting legacy to it. So we could we could choose that one. We want to go into okay. one of the biomes. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do that so one. Let's go. So did you turn your command block? Uh, I did, but I've got to go back into 
world builder. There you go. Or turn it off, rather. Now Did I you remind us why he has to do that? Again? Oh, why do we have to turn command blocks back on? Oh, because uh, because that's what's used to... Um, so command blocks are, you know, a one of the programming methods inside of Minecraft. And so there's uh, all kinds of flow and checking and things like that happening in the background through command blocks. So um, disabling them will kind of break the flow of the game. So we're keeping keeping the game kind of working by by keeping the command blocks on. Uh, we, we gave Eric a little kind of a hacked version so he could shut things off and we can fly around and go adventure in, outside of what you would normally be able to do in the official game so we can give you a little sneak peek of some things. Uh, so the students participating are not necessarily going to be able to do what we're doing now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an open book. Anybody can do what we're doing. You just would have to know how. It's not, it's not uh. easy to know how to do it, but... Where there's a will, there's a way. And what we've learned, though, is uh, clever is lives up to his namesake and is extremely clever because he has built into the game sort of a mechanism to detect if this has been done to modify a score. <laughs> oh yes. Well, so you know, like if, if students were able to figure all of this out, which you know, kudos to students uh, if they are really digging into it, because it means that there's a knowledge base and even a willingness to kind of discover and learn how to do things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that I, I like to commend that that is there, uh, but ne we wouldn't necessarily reward that score. <laughs> right. You know, that score is not necessarily eligible if they're using that. You know. Right, those I'm people are getting offers for cyber security. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the challenge for us, which was really fun, which was really fun last year, was uh, like, how do we, you know, where do we stop? You know, where do we make this, um, you know, hack proof? And where do we just say, well, if somebody goes through that level of detail, then uh, we can't protect against everything, you know? And so. Uh, it was funny because when we were developing it, first of all, like uh, you guys all give me a lot of credit for this and I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't be possible for me without surrounding myself with a great team. So my my designers and my programmers that that I work with on a constant basis for these uh, for these projects really are what make all of this magic come together. It's definitely not something I could have managed to do alone. Uh, especially in the time frame that we do here, you know, it could become my lifelong project if I was doing it alone and then it would be irrelevant. So surrounding yourself with good people, I think is a good, is a good lesson in life because a lot of the great things, a lot of the great experiences I've had have been um, with other people as collaborators and, and friends and partners. And so um, I highly recommend that. So if you're a student in school, think about who your friends are and who you're hanging out with and what do they do to bring out the best in you and the best in like what you can do for yourself in the future. So um, definitely find a lot of rewarding moments from working with people that kind of push you to do something uh, beyond what you might normally be capable of by yourself. So That's a great point. Lesson. That's a great point. And I find people with different personalities and different interests, we make good teams, right? Even if you just look at all of us here, we all have different personalities and interests and things that we do. Different little specialties can help you accomplish a project or a task too. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think every, most people are by nature somewhat competitive. And so, you know, if you surround yourself with people who are not really motivating you, then you're not motivated. You, you already feel like you're kind of achieving a level of success that makes you happy. But when you surround yourself with people that are, that are talented and motivated and creative and, you know, and positive, then you have to bring your game up to meet them. And then you might want to push which they'll appreciate because you'll push them to, to do better as themselves and you're pushing mm -hmm. yourself to do better. So you're amplifying like your possibilities and uh, the possibilities of the people around you. So um, I think that's, that's one of the lessons I always try to, that, you know, that I learned sometimes the hard way and try to encourage my kids and other, other students to, um, to take great, you know, uh, care, for, uh, you know, in who you work with and who you collaborate with. Definitely makes sense. 
my dad was Talk. a my dad was a police officer, and so he used to call me and be like, "Hey, remember your buddy from middle school that I told you was no good?" I'm like, "Yeah." brought him into jail the other day i'm like you were right dad thank you like i am glad i stopped hanging around with that kid so uh you know he was giving me the intel on kind of how time transpired um but yeah mm -hmm. sur surrounding yourself with uh with the right influences is, is huge and i have a great team at clever life studios that's awesome. So Brian, today I'm taking time to kind of look around and explore a little more than I have before. And first off, this is awesome. But secondly, I'm wondering, how do you, how do you get all the knowledge for, you know, I mean, there's a lot of information in here just about scientists and, you know, mm -hmm. insect resistance and all this kind of thing. How do you get all of that information to put it into a world like this? Yeah, well, I force Adam against his will to spend hours, <laughs> re you know, reading dialogue. And I sit there and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what if I say the wrong thing uh, if it's left up to me? And so I, I panic and I make sure that the people who know stuff are there to help guide me. So it's definitely not something that I would ever be capable of writing all of the stuff alone. And obviously, too, when, when you collaborate, usually you come up with a better product because you get different inputs and, and different feedback. So, yeah, uh, I would say um, Adam and uh, the rest of the team have really contributed to making a lot of this dialogue. Oh, and and one thing Kate, I just said, Dr. KateFurby.com also was yeah. a big part of it. <laughs> yeah, it was involved in Farmcraft 2021. But one thing I just say is that, you know, I definitely gave brian a hand and so did other people that are members of the team which is always important but the real thing that brian did was a lot of research you know he obviously obviously spent a lot of time developing this world and pulling it all together but he did his own research he went out on you know got on the internet search engines and started you know trying to learn things typing in terms that were relevant and you know diving into all of that and um we should probably actually produce our seeds we went for spotted radish that are drought tolerant and good for the soil. But um, the one thing I, but I would like to encourage Air, um, Brian to actually talk a little bit about his process for selecting um, the, you know, his sources and learning about all of these things that were not necessarily his specialty. And how, you know, to some extent, how did you determine what sources you, you could trust? Because that's, you know, the internet's a crazy place and not necessarily everything is always going to be, um, accurate so how did you go about doing that brian right well you know of course i had my personal experience right in from my backyard and i'm like okay like i know what my problem was and i'm going to see how whatever is uh, i learn is relevant to and applicable to my problem so i had my own the schema that i have been developing from my own experiences now to to kind of use when when judging what information is good, but especially like with this season, some of the things that were like mind blowing for me is some of like the government websites that are like dedicated to agriculture and helping farmers. And it's like, Hey, here's a list of all agriculture problems and how to address them. I'm like, wow, look at this. Where was this? <laughs> and it was so clear and easy and like easy to read and understand. And so, um, so two things there, like, the first source, which is another good life lesson, is that we talked to people who have dedicated their lives and their careers to this subject. They're very passionate about it. They have done a lot of work and being able to ask them, you know, when you get in front of somebody that has like that level of knowledge and experience, being able to ask them questions and learn from them is a huge benefit and also a huge opportunity. So think of yourself as a young student and you have somebody who is in a career in the future. And most adults want you as a student to succeed. They want to see motivated people, you know, achieve the success that they deserve from their work. And so um, when you when you show someone like that, that you're interested in care and you're trying, you know, you apply that effort, which that equation comes together. If you go to college, you can't get away with without that formula. Um, you know, you put that effort in and it's noticeable, those people will help you and they'll want you to succeed. And you're building, uh, not only are you learning, but you're also building your network and your future opportunities. Cause those people will be like, I remember that student who was asked a lot of really good questions and did a lot of work and worked really hard and really has a bright future. And it would be great if I could help that person sometime. 
So mm -hmm. that's that's the mind of like the adults like in this room here. And also most of the adults that you'll interface with, they would love to share what they know and they would love to see you succeed if it's something that you're willing to invest your time and effort in becoming familiar with. And I think a lot of kids exclude themselves from the possibilities. Oh, I'm too young. I'm just this. I don't know enough or whatever. But no, like motivation trumps mm -hmm. knowledge in a lot of cases, which means the more motivated you are, the more it matters to people uh, because mm -hmm. they could teach you if you're motivated. If you're not motivated, even if you know everything and don't want to do anything with it, it's not as useful. So keep that in mind. Thank for sure. That's so okay true with the people on your team, Ryan, that we met over the years that were young. Yes. Yeah, like right. you, we've we've had um, like this this map was built by um, he was in high school. Now he's in in college uh, studying architecture. Um, so yeah, so we definitely were able to kind of nurture motivated youth that had the time and and the you know the motivation to do stuff we were able to give them opportunities that translate into something like this becomes a portfolio and a, a builder for you know their point in time it doesn't mean they're going to be building minecraft for the rest of their life but this was a real good uh important piece of their of their path mm -hmm. i have a big question for you rain where did you learn about facultative anaerobes? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, I was fascinated by that. Like, it makes so much sense. You know, like uh, my, my one daughter that studied a lot of biology, um, she um, she loves, uh, I, I, the name escapes me, but she's the, this uh, kind of uh, thing that you can cut it in, and you can cut it in half anywhere and it would just regenerate. It'll, you know, if you cut it in half, you'll have two of them. Um, and so uh, she's going to kill worms. me. She's going to kill me for not knowing the, uh, the flatworms. No, it's the flatworm. Platy helminthes. Yeah. yeah. What's the uh, what's the proper? Eric just said it. Platy helminthes. No. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that 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 <laughs> idea. So you can cut them like long ways, cross ways. They regenerate. Mm -hmm. She loves them. Um, and so uh, that interested me and then when we learned about these facultative anaerobes which are basically like my understanding of it and adam's like you know he likes to break down the origin of words and stuff like that you know and so you're talking about like anaerobes you have this like air right like you're talking about breathing and facultative like what's that have to do with like work or facilitating or make you know making use of it how, uh, what are, you have that mean? just means um uh, um oh god goodness it's been a minute since i've thought about that it means can make use of and so it's it's uh it the the the, the core the the opposite is obligate so if you're an obligate anaerobe you can only live in an environment that doesn't have oxygen and me and you we're obligate aerobes we have to have oxygen otherwise we don't last a whole a whole long while Wow. Yeah. See, that's cool. Wow. And so these things are like, Hey, if you, if you water them too much and suffocate them, they will turn on a different mode where they'll start to process, they'll start to breathe a different way. And that different way actually ex excretes uh, a more harmful gas than the carbon environment gas. So, you know, so learning that like just absolutely blew my mind and uh, made overwatering seem so much more real and, and, you know, concerning. I'm just noticing, I mean, it makes sense because of the biome that we're in, but I feel like we're watering way more than we ever have before. Is that just me? And I feel like the soil just keeps drying out and drying out. Kind yeah, of well, like where so, I live right yeah, now. Good, good point. So this is because um, one of one of the trade offs of a high of a high profit crop is the high demand on your on your soil and so this crop is is programmed to consume like the water and the 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 um the soil health and that's what makes it harder to keep up with so you're you're having to you're having to actually um maintain your soil a lot more aggressively because you're in a poor soil climate and you have a crop that has high demands on your soil um but you'll notice bugs and weeds were not that big of a problem. 
That's mm -hmm. why you're spending all your time maintaining the soil in this environment with that crop. So hardy grass is designed to go a lot smoother, a lot easier, but um, it's not going to it's not going to make you as much money. So let's see, it's the fun trade off we made in in creating this is like really like we labored over how to kind of balance it so that like you try to do this one and it's safer, but it's not as productive. And the more productive things are a little more impactful. And so now you're in this dilemma of how do I um, how do I balance that out? And for us as game makers, that's uh, it's a real challenge and it's real fun when we hear people on the live streams or on the uh, these videos talk about how we were doing this and then it stopped then and we realized it was a bad idea. So we started doing something else. We're like, yes, that's the plan. So, um, so yeah, it's really cool when everything comes together. That's cool. So um, one thing that I'm going to just say about this team, we talked earlier about who you, you know, who you work with, who you do projects with at school and that kind of thing. You all have been so nice to me learning. <laughs> And I was hanging out with some kids who were gaming this weekend. And let's just say they were not quite as nice as you are <laughs> during uh, the learning process. And I just want to say, like, that's super important to, you know, help people out. I'm figuring out I did not really play in Farmcraft before last year very much, I admit. And so now it's, you know, I'm figuring out, for example, how to drive on land and not in water and, <laughs> you know, all these different things. But this isn't necessarily a comment related to your development, Brian, but I just want to say like you all are a great team and I hope that the kids watching um, take a lesson from that. And have some patience and support. Yeah, yeah like it helps yeah. to remember that you were a learner once too and you had that uncomfortable question where everyone knew the answer and you didn't and you, know, you were embarrassed and didn't know what to do. But when you learned it, you felt much better about yourself. Uh, and that's not the moment where you start to judge other people that don't know it. That's the moment where you remember how it feels to not know and mm -hmm. to help share that information with other people. So you, so the, the way I explain it to, to people um, in general is like, you want to, you want to lift, you know, the, 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 the quote about like rising boat, uh, rising tide raises all boats, you know, basically lift the people around you and mm -hmm. it, it will just naturally elevate you in that process so you don't have to be you you can you can also grow by helping other people grow and so i think that's an important lesson and um, think about ways of supporting each other and the minecraft community is an excellent community for that like our, our competitors all of our competitors meet in a in a private discord and we help each other solve problems Mm. which we could be like, no, me, mine, you go figure it out yourself. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a certain amount of that. But but for the most part, you ask a question, someone will answer it. And, and that's that's huge. That's, that's really why is. Cool. That's why it's so you know, really cool. One of the things that I, you know, that, that I try to explain to students, uh, but also, you know, I implement myself is, you know, one of the best things about gaming to me is this a sense of community you get from it. And to be honest, during the pandemic, uh, it was one of those things that carried me through a lot of it because, you know, we need community, right? We are social creatures as human beings. And it was one of those things that was hard to get. And gaming kind of gave that opportunity to all of us in some, one way or another. Uh, and you want to grow that community. And you only do that if you invite people into the community. You welcome them and you share with them any knowledge you have and hope for the same in return. Uh, it's going to grow your knowledge of a variety of games. You'll get to be the expert sometimes and others won't be. Uh, you will experience frustration with others. You will. Uh, but again, that's a learning opportunity to say, what do I do when I experience uh, those kind of frustrations? Uh, and if you're not sure what to do when you experience those frustrations, all of you who are watching, if you're students or otherwise, uh, have a teacher in some form of another and ask them because they have experienced those frustrations with everybody. And they are pros at what do I do when I'm experiencing <laughs> that level of frustration when trying to educate somebody about something. Right. That's a great suggestion. So yeah. I know we have a few things that we want to cover about the next challenges, but maybe we can just take a couple minutes, Brian, and talk about your path to your yeah. current career, because how many students, it is their dream job to yes. be doing something like what you're doing. So okay. uh, how'd you get there? Absolutely. Like, so first of all, like from, from when I was a kid, I was really curious. I wanted to learn. I was motivated to learn. I focused on finding friends that were like minded and wanted to learn together and spend the time. And we helped each other out. We collaborated a lot. So before internet, 
I would go to people's houses, spend time on the phone like this, typing before for hours. Before the internet? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost before the actual like DARPA net, but no, not quite. Uh, but so, so, uh, so yeah, like um, just think about like how you're spending your time as, as, a, a, as a youth, basically, and who you're surrounding yourself with and how you're spending your motivation, investing your motivation. So I did a lot of that and ended up going to school for computer science and meeting people doing cool things, getting a great job right out of school, promptly quitting that job uh, at a Fortune 150 company for IT, great future. Like one of my buddies from that job is now like this the chief security officer there. Um, so that's, that's kind of like where I would have been if I, uh, you know, uh, in that realm, if I stayed in that company, but I chose a different route to do my own thing, uh, with a friend, of course. So, which is where great things happen. And, um, spent a lot of years in, in the software industry. And then I got to do my own thing and I started to, you know, got into Minecraft. And so the interest, the interesting thing here is, um, I was running a business that I was like, okay, this business is not the business I need to be in. I need to be doing this Minecraft stuff. So I was getting ready to sell that and get that off of my plate. And I was going all in on Minecraft. And Kathy can attest to like, I, I was like, uh, there was this Minefair show and I was like, I'm all, I'm completely in. I'm putting all my chips in on, on Minecraft. And so I was like, I would like to volunteer for, uh, to teach at every single Minefair in the entire country, like all 10 cities for, and you know, like Steve, Call, called me up. He's like, Hey, did you mess up on this form? Or did you really want to go to all cities? I'm like, every city sign me up. I don't care. I'll get, I'll pay my own way, whatever. So, so I went into that with, with, I'll just invest everything on my own. And I, and I, I created, I tried to create as much value as possible. And so it quickly got to the point where, um, you, okay, like, okay, you're doing stuff like you're valuable. We need you. We'll help get you to the next show and we'll help get you to the next show. It ended at the point where I had a, a show on the main stage. I had a 50 foot booth with 40 computers playing all of my games and presentations at the learning lab and on the inspiration stage at that show, because I just took my, my motivation and basically zero like guarantee and just made it work. Um, so I think that's a, that's an important thing. Like it's okay to do something and spend your time in order to grow and get there. And so I just asked Steve and Kathy if they would pack me in their luggage because they had the coolest life wherever they were doing all these cool things. And so I'm like, just please put me in your luggage and take me wherever you go. And that's basically come true. You know, Brian, I, I feel I think like it's, I a lot of what you're describing here is a lot of what we talk about at NASAF, how you know, there are a ton of careers out there that are close to gaming and esports. And if you find your passion, find a way to work in it because you're going to be spending a lot of hours in your career, right? And so find something that you love to do. And as you said earlier, like we will help if we can, the people around you, the college mm -hmm. that you go to, your professors. People want to help you succeed, but I'm with you. You, you got to send it a little bit, right? Like there's going to be a little bit of risk, but find something that you love. Yeah. Another another quick point about how I became a micro, uh, Minecraft partner. I knew I knew that these add-ons for the Bedrock Edition were going to be big, and and I was teaching kids Minecraft for a long time, and I, the in the Java side, and I was like, okay, this is big, and so I invested my time in learning, and I was like the first one to produce like a real legitimate tutorial on like how to customize Minecraft in the Bedrock version, you know, where mods were the big thing in Java. And we just got an announcement on YouTube. We've got like 25,000 hours of views from our educational material that we have produced on that channel. And so that wow. was my, my first thing that was like, I could remember I took over my son's room. I took all the lawn, the patio furniture cushions to create a little sound booth. And I recorded these tutorials and, uh, and put them out there for free. And I started getting thanked by my marketplace partners. Like, thank you so much. You saved the day. Um, we would have never been able to do this without you. And then one of the teams was like, hey, thank you so much. I'm like, and then brought me under their wing and got me involved in their projects, which eventually got me in the door to become one of the Minecraft partners. So it all started with, with really like a, an act of just giving with no guarantee of what would come back. But I kept that focus and the motivation yeah. and, and added value and put it out there. And these things come back to you uh, automatically. You don't know where they're coming from. You don't know how to expect them, but just keep doing, doing what you love and 
and giving to others when you can. Awesome. I think Kathy wants to add something. I'm also just, I yeah. have my eye on the clock. So we'll, we'll have Kathy I'm, add a last comment and then we're going to. I'm boom, trying to minutes. use the raise my hand react response. But we don't have one in stream. Yet. Yeah. Like, okay. But I think too, for Brian, it's like, this is a great story of, um, you know, creating something on your own and not waiting for somebody to give you that opportunity. You know, if this is something that you're really interested in, well, then you are absolutely allowed to create this job, this position, this this work that you want to do, you know. Um, Passion and the entrepreneurial okay. spirit. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, your story, Steve's story, so similar, right? I mean, creating something that you, you dream you know you're creating your gene position really right. so so yeah that's all i wanted to say i could put my hand down now thank you thank you awesome well eric we have a couple things that we were going to talk about for challenge number three do you want to bring up Nathan i think we can do four. that yeah let's and we had that. a let's we had a comment that. from one of the students saying this is so inspiring and that is certainly our goal is we want to play we want to have fun with you we also want everyone to know you can do it decide mm -hmm. what you want to do try it out give it your best shot guess what if it doesn't go as planned shift course try something else it's all right to make mistakes and fail and then try again and do things a different way so take it away eric all right um so yeah, one of the things we mentioned right at the beginning was making sure you're getting your challenge entries in. Again, you want to make sure all three challenge entries, regular season challenge entries are in to make you eligible for prizes, especially when submitting those scores. And of course that submit score button is right up here at the top of the Farmcraft page on NACEF. So nacef.org. And of course you could always just go to learning and Farmcraft is right there. Of course, you can also go to uh, compete Oh, I hit the calendar events uh, and go to Minecraft events and you'll see Farmcraft here as well. So lots of ways to get there. We mention that every time and we're going to keep mentioning it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but we want to talk about uh, regular season challenge three because that will post today, even though regular season challenge two is still open. You can still, of course, if you need to go back and submit any of the challenges to make sure you've got them all complete because you want to make sure your team is eligible. Um, but we are trying to stay within that time frame. It helps us keep track of everything that's coming in. So we're going to ask you to do us that favor and try to stay on schedule. Uh, but let's look at regular season challenge three, which is now posted right here in here. And uh, I will go ahead and join with my Microsoft account. Let's do that real quick. And hopefully it won't ask me to verify things because now we've got that two point verification. I have to do it all the time. It's lots of fun. Um, but here's regular season challenge three. So in our last challenge, in challenge two, and many of you are still working on that one, and that's great because now you can get kind of the ball rolling, the juices going in your brain to say, what if we did the opposite? What if instead of focusing all our efforts on profit, we focused all of our efforts, all of them, on protecting the climate at, and whatever it takes to protect the climate, to make our climate score perfect uh, and keep it that way? What do we have to do to make that happen? So. You'll notice it looks very similar, but we've changed up what your focus is, right? So we want you to now focus on minimizing climate impact and improving sustainability in your biomes. Um, and that's, we want to be the sole focus of what you do. Don't worry about your profits. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about, uh, you know, your, even though they will play a factor, don't put all of your focus on, you know, water or soil health or anything like that. Just keep that climate score up, um, at, you know, and as perfect as you can keep it. Um, so do all of that. And then, of course, just like before, you're going to go in, you're going to create your video, and you're going to focus on asking yourself and your team certain questions. How did focusing purely on climate affect things? Uh, how did that affect your outcomes? How uh, how was your climate affected? How was your ability to make a profit or feed a population affected? Uh, and did your ex your team experience any limitations or challenges as a result of that? So what happens if we put all of our attention, every last ounce of it, onto climate? Now, that's not to say that's not a inspiring or good goal to have, uh, but like anything else, that's not going to come without challenges. And, and maybe we'll find out what some of those challenges are along the way if we actually give that a shot. And, and it goes exactly above a thousand. You can get more than a thousand on your climate score. So you could start reversing. Climate. Right. Because if you think ah. about it, you're we're, we're entering these biomes and there's already and established effect. farmland that has been cleared. Right. Mm -hmm. There's. 
populations of people living there and, and civilization that has sort of, I mean, within the extent of the biome, but there's buildings and things that have, have been built yeah. there and infrastructure, so uh, roads, a lab, score. all of that, right? Yep. The score keeps going up. So you can get the highest possible score on the climate. Wow. Yeah. So that's the goal. Get us just maximize that climate score as best you can and see how that affects everything else that you yeah. do. Yeah. Cool. Let's play. And All what's right. great about yeah. that is it will in, it'll invite us into the conversation of saying, okay, we max it, we put all our attention on profit, which we just did for challenge two, and we're still doing for challenge two, still open. We're putting all of our attention on climate, which is for challenge three, which is just opening now. Now we get to have the conversation and say, well, did either of those methods perfectly work? What do we need to do to make everything the way we want it and to effectively create uh, sustainable climates where we're still feeding people because we've got to feed people. So how do we do it? How do we, how do we make it all work? Right, exactly. Well, and this is such a great place to do that because you can't do that in the real world, right? Like you can't go, okay, I'm just going to blow all my money and see what happens right. or, you know, so it's great that we have a simulation like this one where you can sort of mm -hmm. go to both extremes and then learn and determine what is the right middle ground. It's it's literally what makes a sandbox game a sandbox game and, and honestly the perfect it platform. Trade for this. That balance the mm -hmm. balance. Mm -hmm. For sure. Awesome. And so when is challenge number three due, Eric? So this one will be due, and actually they will all, because at this point we'll have closed out our regular season challenges, be due by May 27th. Uh, so that gives you a a little bit more than two weeks to work on those. Make sure you have all three of them completed. If you haven't, so go back and make sure those are in. Uh, also submit your scores, make sure those scores are in. Um, and then join us. Uh, we've got another stream coming up on the 25th beforehand, which is gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, Claire came up with a super clever name for that one too. Uh, and then of course we've got our award stream just to follow. Uh, the next few weeks are jam packed as we head into the end of the school year, which of course it's always jam packed, but um, we do have a stream coming up in a couple of weeks and we are going to be talking about uh, the experiences that different of uh, different students and educators have had all around the world. And we're going to call this from the field, haha, because we want to know nice. what's happening out in the field. What are you experiencing? whether you're in Japan or the United States or, you know, different countries all around. How are students- the American spacers. <laughs> all the American spacers, yes. So we are um, collecting videos and input from you. And actually, if you wanna just shoot us a quick email and let us know what you're doing and how much fun you're having, you'd be welcome to do that. Maybe we could share a couple on the stream. We're at info at nasef.org. And that was just a little impromptu comment, but I think it could be fun to hear from a few extra people in addition to what we have planned already for you. So we will be back here in person um, two weeks from today on May 25th, sharing ideas and information from around the world. And um, we also have a photo voice activity that's going on right now. So um, Eric, do you wanna talk about that? Yep, so all of the uh, adult sponsors were sent that information as. Uh, as well, we mentioned it on the last call, uh, but there is a photo voice act, uh, activity for our high school students that was sent out. And for those who complete that or the survey um, and participate in the survey, there is the opportunity to be awarded some custom Minecraft skins that you will only be able to get through this program and through participating in that opportunity. So lots of fun, some free stuff uh, for your Minecraft games and your Minecraft worlds. So uh, highly recommended to check it out. Farmcraft mashup skins. Mashup. I like the mashup idea. Cyborg farmer with a there seems Z, to be a Citron attachment added. A big uh, fandom for beards. So if some of those can have some <laughs> epic, whether they're cybernetic or otherwise, beards, like, would be. <laughs> you need your own dedicated pack. bearded yeah. cyborgs. <laughs> All for it. Yep. Yeah, look for those. They'll be they'll be super cool, and they'll give you that uh, that credibility amongst your uh, amongst your peers having competed. Love it. Oh, Claire, I think you're muted again. Twice we had to, we had to open and close twice? the same way. I can't believe it. Oh my gosh! All right, thank you for joining us today. Um, 
so much fun. And Brian, clever like, we really appreciate Thanks. your insights and the advice that you shared. Really quality information for everyone. And we will look forward to seeing you all right here in two weeks. Don't forget to submit one, two, three submissions. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much.